Good to see once again so many come out this morning to worship the Lord together with us. <clears throat> we are in the book of Psalm, studying the book of Psalm. It's one of those uh, books that is an all-time favorite, and this morning it will be what Psalm 107 to Psalm 111. <clears throat> I've entitled the message this morning, Deliverance, and it can be a bit difficult when you go through several psalms to kind of give a heading because they're a little bit different. But I think if you take the kind of summary, deliverance is a theme for this morning. You know, John Patton was a missionary, and uh, he was a missionary in New uh, uh, Hebrides Islands. And one night, he was surrounded by the native people, the Indians, I guess we could say. And uh, they threatened to burn down the mission and to kill him. Pat and his wife prayed during the terror-filled night that God would deliver them. When daylight came, they were amazed to see that their attackers left. A year later, the chief who had been there that, that night with his tribe to try to burn down the mission and kill him was saved. Mr. Patton asked him, he said, why did you leave that particular night and, and he said, well, who were the people who were with you? He said, we, ha- we saw people all around your mission. And uh, they were standing there with swords drawn. He said, we were afraid and we left. Mr. Patton knew that God had miraculously delivered them from the hands of the enemy. You know, Jesus is our Messiah. He's not just a savior in the sense that he delivers us from sin. But also, he delivers us so many times through our life from different adversities. And Psalm 107 is a psalm that describes just that. That five times we see the psalm where people found themselves in in a plight and they call out to God. And then we see the cycle repeat itself. They, They walked away from the Lord or they found themselves in some issue... And they called out to the Lord, and God delivered them. So we see that five times. What is interesting is that we see that God delivered them every time. It's not that one time they, one time they call out on God, and God doesn't deliver that time. No, he, he delivers them every time. Let's begin reading in verse 1. It says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy and gathered out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Now the psalmist opens the psalm with the word of praise, giving thanks to God. And he gives an introduction of what he will be writing about, the regathering of the Jews from the lands. Psalms 105 and Psalms 106 talk about the journey out of Egypt and into Canaan. And Psalm 107 talks about the journey back from Babylon to Israel. So it's interesting to see that, that they are coming back from Babylon, back from captivity, and five times we see that they, they err. They walk astray, and God delivers them. So when you read through this, you could easily see this as the journey out of Egypt into Canaan, but it's not. It is from captivity back into Israel. So, verse 4. They wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. So they're journeying back. There's Nehemiah, Zerubbabel. Um, there's one other guy uh, that took him back. They, they took him from Babylon back. And it seems that they got lost on the way. They didn't know where to go. They were in the wilderness. There was heat. They didn't have a town to sleep in. They were lost. It's like you're traveling and you're, like, you're lost. You, you, know, you don't know where to go. And they cry out to the Lord. And he heard them, and he delivers them. How many times we may have found our way uncertain or lost? We don't know the future. It's uncertain. 
and we cry out to the Lord and he delivers us. In James chapter 4, it says, you have not because you ask not. And how many times does that take ha happen in our lives? We have not because we ask not. I remember years ago, it was at the onset of this church, and uh, there was uh, a team that had come down, and, and we were having a service. And this guy was, was just kind of showing us what type of Bible he had, and someone said, um, man, I wish he had a Bible like that. And he said, well, you have not because you ask not. You know, ask for the Bible, and he gave it to him. You know, you, you have not because you ask. And how many times Jesus is there, we, he finds ourselves in a plight, he sees us struggling, and he longs to help us, but he would like us to ask him. And when we do, he delivers us. Verse 7, he says, And he led them forth by the right way, that they might go to the city for a dwelling place, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. See, Christ is our only source of fulfillment and satisfaction. He alone can deliver us from, from an empty, hungry soul. It is only the Lord. Men seek fulfillment in all kinds of ways but there's only one source of fulfillment and that is Jesus Christ they were empty they were hungry they were afflicted and they cried out to God and he delivered them verse 7 and he led them forth by the right way uh, you see here verse 7 yeah he, he led them forth by the right way and they that they might go to a city for a dwelling place oh that man would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. Those who sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, bound in affliction and irons, because they rebel against the words of God and despise the counsel of the Most High. Therefore he brought them down to their heart with, with labor. They fell down and there was none to help. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. Notice that every single time when they cry out to God, he saves them. It's not like God is like, I saved you last time, I saved you last week, I saved you a month ago, I'm not going to do it again. Every time they are in trouble, they, 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 they walk away from the Lord, or what, and, he, and, he, and, he, and he, he delivers them. See, it was Israel's rebellion that brought them into captivity. And they're bound in afflictions, it says here, and of iron. Today, one might find himself in afflictions and of iron. You know, people walk off the path on their journey and find themselves in all kinds of afflictions. But again, God delivers you every time. Verse 16, or let's read verse 15. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he has broken the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron in two. These are interesting verses. And you see that when you go through the Psalms, that all of a sudden one verse is like it's a prophecy. Some are messianic prophecies, some are other prophecies. But in, but Isaiah, in Isaiah of chapter 45, you read that he mentions the name Cyrus that King Cyrus is going to deliver Babylon or the Jews out of Babylon. He's going to allow them to move back. And if you study when Isaiah was written and when the Babylonians let Israel go back into the land, that was 150 years later. Isaiah mentions King Cyrus by name 150 years before he was born. It was King Cyrus that came against Babylon after the 70 years had completed. And it was time for Israel to go back into the land. King Cyrus came. They fought for years to get into the city, but they couldn't. Until one day, they had a plan. They diverted the ocean, the Euphrates River, about a mile upstream from the city. They diverted it. And the river temporarily flowed in a different direction. 
and the city flowed right to the city of Babylon, and the river went down. And they were able to go down into the river, and they broke the iron gates. Actually, history tells us they were open. I don't know if we could really verify that. Here it says they broke the gates. They walked in. And that was the very night that Belshazzar was having a feast. And he was mocking the Jews, and he was taking the vessels that had been taken from the temple that his forefathers, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken from the temple, and he was feasting with them. He was using them for wine, for alcoholic beverages, getting drunk, and then all of a sudden a writing appeared on the wall that says, many, many take of Harsin, and he was afraid. The Bible says that his hips shook. Basically, he couldn't hold his... Uh, his bowel movement. And he was so afraid that he called Daniel. He was an old man by that time, probably in his 80s, a very old man. He called Daniel, and Daniel interpreted for him. He said, you have been weighed in the scales, and you have been found wanting. You're a lightweight, Belshazzar. Tonight, Daniel said, your life will be taken from you. King Cyrus came through the gates. He broke the iron gate. He came in and he took the life of Belshazzar that night. And it was Cyrus that then allowed the Jews to go back to Israel. So let's read verse 16 again. For he has broken the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron in two. Verse 17, fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities were afflicted, their soul abhorred all manner of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them. He delivered them from their destruction. See, fools who deliberately disobeyed God, and they reaped the consequences by being ensnared in the very gates of death. But again, they called on the Lord, and he delivered them. We see the cycle over and over. It's really a six-prong cycle, if you would. Israel serves the Lord. Israel falls into sin and idolatry. And then Israel is enslaved. Israel cries out to the Lord. God raises up a judge, and Israel is delivered. And then the cycle repeats itself. We see that this repeats itself five times in Psalms 107. And the five times, God delivers them. And then bring us to Psalm 108. This is the Psalm of David. It's a Psalm that, where David describes victory over his enemies. It's really a Psalm that is compiled of two Psalms. It's Psalm 57 and Psalm 60. There are certain verses taken out of Psalm 57 and certain verses out of Psalm 60, and you compile them, and you come up with Psalm 108. Isn't it interesting that even though it could have been uh, years later, but that old song, if you look at it, psalms are really songs. Before we had praise and worship, what we have now today, contemporary, before that they had hymns, for that, they sang the, the psalms. They, they just literally, in the old, the early church, just sang the, the psalms. They were, they were songs. And we see that, that the old songs are compiled, put together, and it now makes a new song. The Bible says that we are to sing a new song unto the Lord. But you know, we can sing an old song. We can sing an old hymn. But it becomes a new song when it fits the new challenge that we face at that time. It becomes relevant. It becomes like, wow, this is so refreshing. This is a new song. So he writes a psalm that we really have covered already before, and he compiles it, and he puts it together. Verse 1, it says, The psalm of David, O God, my heart is steadfast. I will sing and give praise, even with my glory. Awake, lute and harp. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, O Lord, among the people. Just like he's getting up early in the morning and he is trying to stir up his musical instruments to start praising the Lord. Verse 4, For your mercy is great and above the heavens, and your truth reaches to the clouds. 
Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and your glory above all the earth, that your beloved may be delivered. Save with your right hand and hear me. God has spoken in his holiness. I will rejoice. I will divide Shechem and measure out the valley of Sukkoth. Gilead is mine. Manasseh is mine. Ephraim also is the helmet for my head. Judah is my lawgiver. Moab is my washpot. Over Edom, I will cast my shoe. Over Philistia, I will triumph. Who will bring me into the strong city? Who will lead me to Edom? It is you. Is it not you, O God, who cast us off? And you, O God, who did not go out with our armies? Give us help from trouble, for the help of man is useless. Through God we will do valiantly, for it is he who shall tread down our enemies. See, man's help is so temporary, so vain. Men will let you down, but God's help is sufficient. He comes through every time. Psalms 109, this is a psalm of David. It's an imprecatory psalm. Uh, An imprecatory psalm is, what it really means is, it's a psalm when the psalmist prays judgment or even a curse on his enemies. Now, some people might have an issue with such a psalm. But they're good psalms because this is a psalm that David writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And God is a compassionate God, that's true. God is a gracious God. He's a merciful God, but God is also a righteous God. And therefore, God must judge unrighteousness. He has to judge evil. Suppose God would say to, say, Stalin, who was the dictator of Russia for many years ago, who killed about 9 million people, starved about 4 million in Ukraine alone in the early 1900s. God would say to him, you know what? Uh, yeah, I'm just going to... You know, you were just a product of your environment, and, and so you couldn't help yourself just coming into heaven. This is fine. No, that would be unrighteous. He has to punish evil. He has to punish sin. He is a righteous God, And he must, therefore, deal and punish sin. And that's what we see here in Psalms um, 109, is that David prays that God will judge evil. Verse 1. Do not keep silent, O God, of my praise, for the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful have opened against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. They have also surrounded me with words of hatred and fought against me without a cause. In return for my love, they are my accusers, but I give myself to prayer. This is David, and and he's writing about injustice that's being done to him. Now, who is that person? It doesn't say. It could be. His advisor, Ahithophel, we know that he turned against David in the most difficult time of David's life. We see that his trusted Ahithophel turned against him. Probably because he committed sin with Bathsheba, who was the grand, would have been Ahithophel's granddaughter. He probably still harbored something against David. It could have been uh, Absalom who was at the city gate stealing the hearts of the men when they were coming to Jerusalem to receive counsel, to receive help from the king. He stood there at the gate and he said, ah, you know, the king is busy. The king doesn't have time to hear your case. And he would hear the case and he would give them a favorable uh, answer. And he said, oh, if someone would make me king, then I could listen to to your cause and I could really do something about it. And he stole the hearts of the people. Or it could have been King Saul when David served him in his army. It's, it's possible that it could have been David, uh, Saul because it seems that David is somewhat helpless in the situation. He can't do anything about it. Later on, he would have been king. He was king. He had more authority to, 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 to really to rectify some of these issues. But we see here in verse 4, It says, um, in return for my love, they are my accusers, but I give myself to prayer. 
So it's important that it's an imprecatory psalm. He's calling judgment on his enemies, but he's not doing it himself. He's giving vengeance over to God. God, you're going to deal with this. God, I'm, going, I'm giving this person or this situation into your hands. And David is fighting it out in prayer. He's not coming up to Saul and says, okay, Saul, let's have a duel. Let's fight this out. You take out your sword, I take out. Let's see who wins. It's not how he does it. He prays it out and he fights it in prayer. Verse 6. Set a wicked man over him and let an accuser stand at his right hand. When he is judged, let him be found guilty and let his prayer become sin. Let his days be few and let another take his office and let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. Now we know that this speaks actually of Judas. Later we see in the New Testament that this verse is referenced to Judas. Um, verse 10, let his children be continually be vagabonds and beg. Let them seek their bread also from their desolate places. Let the creditor seize all that he has and let strangers plunder his labor. Let there be none to extend mercy to him and let there be any to favor his fatherless children. Let his posterity be cut off and in generation following, let their name be blotted out. See, David learned early on in fleeing from Saul that he had to depend on the Lord for his deliverance and not on men. We see that David at one point fly, flees to a city and he hears that David comes, uh, Saul is coming against him and he asks the Lord, will thy deliver me into Saul's hands? And the answer from the Lord is, they will deliver you. So David flees again. And this happens numerous times. David is never safe. He's always fleeing. He realizes he cannot depend on men. He has to depend on God. So he learns to fight it out in prayer. We see here that it's an intense prayer. This psalm is really a prayer of David, and it's an intense prayer. This is not like one of those prayers, I lay my down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. No, this, this, is, this is an intense prayer. This is heavy duty, laboring in prayer before the Lord. And I think the earlier we learn that in life, the better. When we learn that you cannot depend on men, you have to depend on on the Lord. And when you find yourself in a really difficult circumstance, go into your prayer closet and pray it through. That's what David did. He fought it out between him and the Lord. A missionary in India tells the story when there's a, a faction of guerrilla warfare going on there in, the, in, the, in, in India at that time, and they came to the church. And they said to the pastor, they said, your next week's offering is going to go to us. It's going to go to our cause. Your offering from your church is going to fund the cause of the guerrillas. And the pastor says, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to fund uh, you. This is the Lord's money. He says, next week we'll be back. If you have not collected the money and you don't have it handed to us, will kill you, your wife, and your children. The pastor resisted. He says, no, we're not going to do that. They left. <laughs> the pastor said he prayed. I mean, it wasn't one of those, you know, just kind of a good night's sleep prayer. It was like he labored in prayer before the Lord. Sunday came. He walked in church, and he preached the gospel. And the guys never showed up. It wasn't until later that he heard that they had made their way to the mission or to their church in a jeep. And the jeep had an accident. It turned over and the guerrillas were all killed. This is warfare. This is, this is a pastor standing in the gap, laboring in prayer, in warfare before the Lord. And God dealt with the enemy. And that is what we see that David is doing in the psalm. He's praying. He's laboring in prayer. Verse 14. Let the iniquity of his fathers be remembered before the Lord. And let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. 
Let them be continually before the Lord, that he may cut off the memory of them from the earth, because he did not remember to show mercy, but persecuted the poor and needy man, that he might even slay the broken in heart. As he loved cursing, so let it come to him. As he did not delight in blessing, so let it be far from him. As he clothed himself with cursing, as with his garment, so let it enter his body like water and let and like oil into his bones. Let it be to him like the garment which covers him, and for a belt with which he girds himself continually. Let this be the Lord's reward to my accusers, and to those who speak evil against my person. But you, O God, the Lord, deal with me for your name's sake, because your mercy is good. Deliver me, for I am poor and needy, and my heart is wounded within me. We see David's vulnerability here. He was hurt when his friends turned against him. Verse 23, I am gone like a shadow when it lightens. I am shaken off like a locust. My knees are weak through fasting, and my flesh is feeble from lack of fatness. I also have become a reproach to them. When they look at me, they shake their heads. When you read through Paul's afflictions in Corinthians where he speaks of all his beatings, you get the sense that, that Paul is saying that his physical body has aged beyond its years because of his afflictions that he has endured for the Lord. And when we look at David's life, we see somewhat the same thing. David's life is a life of, of tribulation, a, a life of, of fleeing from Saul, a life of, of being betrayed by his best friends. It's, it's, it's a life, it's a battle for this man. And we see that he dies in early age, relatively early. We know he dies around his 70s. He wasn't that old. And he was feeble. He, was, he had fought so many wars he had conquered so many nations. When David became the king of Israel, it was in disarray. It was in decline. The nations had begun to, to take them captive that were around them. The, the Philistines and, and all these others, Moab and Edom, they were coming in. And the morale and the spiritual, spirituality of, this, the, the, of Israel was, was just really low. And when he came in, he fought. I mean, this man fought physically. He, he brought together an army. He made the, the, the machine of the government work again. But most of all, this man fought it out in prayer. We could say that his physical body was affected. He fought it through over and over and over again. But the lives of Thousands and millions of people were blessed as a result. He gave his body to be a living sacrifice for the Lord. Today, you and I are here 2,000 years later, actually 3,000 years later, and we're being blessed by this man who gave his physical body to some degree to be used in hardship, to be fought, to use to fight and to to uh, to pray through, and to break the iron gates, to break the chains, so that many people would be blessed. And we see some of the same in the life of Paul. Verse twenty-six. It says, "Help me, O Lord, my God, to save me according to your mercy, that they may know that this is your hand." that you, Lord, have done it. Let them curse, but you bless. When they arise, let them be ashamed, but let your servant rejoice. Let my accusers be clothed with shame, and let them cover themselves with their own disgrace as with a mantle. I will greatly praise the Lord with my mouth. Yes, I will praise him among the multitudes, for he shall stand at the right hand of the poor to save him from those who condemn him. 
Psalms 110, I mean 110, is a psalm of David. And it's, it's a psalm that is quoted by Jesus. It's quoted by Peter. It's alluded to in the New Testament over 25 times. Um, and it's, it's a messianic psalm. It's, it's a reference to the Messiah. Verse 1, it says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Now this is a verse that immediately probably catches your attention. Jesus quoted this in Matthew 22, verse 45. Jesus was clashing with the Pharisees when they came to trap him. And Jesus quotes the psalm and he says, Why does David call his offspring Lord? The Lord said to my Lord. To the Pharisees, this made sense immediately. Because David is calling his offspring that's going to come later on through his generation, he calling them a Lord. That would never be done in Jewish culture. You would never, a father would never call his offspring Lord because they're always lesser. That's how they viewed it. A father is always more than his son. Your son is lesser. So you never call someone that is lesser a Lord. But David did it. He called his offspring Lord. And he said, how is that possible? Jesus was trying to get the Pharisees to think that the Messiah that was to come from David would be greater than David. Well, the Pharisees were stumped, and they dared not ask him any more questions. Verse 3, it says, your people shall be volunteers. You guys hear that? Your people shall be volunteers. Here we got it. And the day of your power and the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn, sworn and, I, and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So again, that's a messianic psalm. It's, it's a reference to Jesus. Who is Melchizedek? We find him mentioned in Genesis 14. When Lot went to Sodom... A group of kings came and took over Sodom and took Lot captive. Abraham rounded up his personal servants, 318 men, and went after them. And he took Lot out of the hands of these kings and he brought them back with all the spoils. And it says that on his way back, Melchizedek met Abraham. And it says that Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine And it says in Genesis 14 that he was a priest of God the Most High. And it says that Abraham gave him a tithe of all his spoil. So who is this priest? It's Melchizedek that met Abraham with bread and wine. And and Abraham gave him a tenth. In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 2, speaking here of Melchizedek, the king of Salem... It says that he, ha- he is a king of peace, of peace without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God and remains a priest continually. This Melchizedek has no father. He has no mother. He, he has no beginning or end. It reminds us of Revelation 22 where Jesus says that I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. So, Melchizedek met Abraham, a priest that has no beginning nor end. Remember Jesus one time was sparring again with the Pharisees? And he said, before Abraham was, I am. And then he said, Abraham saw my day and he praised the Lord and the Pharisees were mad at him and they they, they picked up stones to kill Jesus. He said, you're not even 50 years old and you claim to have seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. It says they took stones to throw at him. So it could be that this is Jesus Christ. This, this, this Melchizedek is none other than Jesus Christ before he came down in the flesh, met Abraham.
And he is, now the psalmist says, or, or priest. The Hebrews, they were in danger of drifting back to a security of, of the temple. Jesus had come. He, he died for our sins. So he was now our priest or high priest. So these Jews, we could say, left the temple. They left their, their old Mosaic religion, the, the, the law. And they came now to a relationship in Jesus Christ by faith. But after some time, they're like, oh, we don't, they, we're not used to this. I mean, all these years we have sacrificed. We had a high priest. We would go to the temple and there was a priest that would mediate between us and God. But where is our mediator? And the Hebrew author says, we have a high priest. The high priest is Melchizedek. He is a priest forever. So don't go back to your old way of life. Don't drift back. No, we have a high priest. We have someone that presents you before God. The word high priest or the word priest in Latin is the word pontifex. The word pontifex, if you look it up, it means build, bridge builder. B bridge builder. A bridge connects two points and he brings it together. That is what a pontifex does. That's what a high priest does. He reaches out to God and he reaches out to men and he brings them together. That is what the high priest Melchizedek, Jesus Christ, has done for us on the cross. It is not now through a Old Testament high priest that we are brought into a relationship. It is in the New Testament high priest, which is none other than Jesus Christ. He is the one that brings us together. John Calvin, Swingley, were men of the Reformation back in the 1600s, and they brought the world, we could say, back to a relationship with Jesus Christ. It was the Catholic Church. It was, it, was, it was the priests that were mediating between men and God. They said, no. It is according to the order of Melchizedek. It is Jesus Christ through him. He is our high priest. And they came up for four principles. They said, no priest but Christ. No sacrifice but Calvary. No confessional but the throne of grace. And no authority but the word of God. And the world was changed. It's according to the order of Melchizedek. He is our mediator. Verse 5. It says... Um, we're in, in Psalms 110 here, okay. But thus I have rewarded, here I'm mixing up my, my, my verses here. The Lord is at your, your right hand. He shall execute kings in day of wrath. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. And he shall execute the heads of many countries. He shall drink the brook of the wayside. There he shall lift up the head. Now verse, uh, Psalm 111, we'll close with that. Um, this is an acrostic psalm meaning that each line begins with a successive letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Um, may have been written this way in order to, for, for memorization purposes. See, the Jews, even after they came back from captivity, as we saw in, verse one, in chapter 107, did not always trust the word of God. They did not always keep the word of God. And this psalm describes for us the blessing that, we, that will befall us if we do trust in God and we fear him at all times. Verse 1 it says, praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. The works of the Lord are great, studied by all those who have pleasure in them. His work is honorable and glorious, and his righteousness endures forever. He has made his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He has given food to those who fear him. He will ever be mindful of his covenant. He has declared to his people the power of his works and giving them an heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are very, 
Verity and justice. All his precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. See, man doesn't always keep his precepts, doesn't always keep his word, but God does. His precepts are sure. Verse, verse 8, they stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. See, we believe in the verbal inspiration of the Word of God, meaning that every word in its original manuscripts was God-breathed or given by God, not just the concepts in the Bible are of God, not just you know, the overall arching theme, theme comes from God. Every word in the Bible comes from God. We believe in the plenary inspiration. That means that all parts of the Bible are inspired. Even the genealogies are inspired by God. All scriptures, all 66 books of the Bible are inspired by God. We believe in the inerrancy of the word of God. And that is that the Bible is without error, or fault in all its teachings, in the original manuscripts, in its original language. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. God's promises stand for two weeks. Mm -mm. Forever and ever. Hold on to the promises of God. It's a solid foundation. It'll, it, it, it's an anchor in a storm. It is something that will keep you steadfast. I was reading or watching a documentary <clears throat> on someone that had been on the Titanic when it sank. They survived. Later, they went on the Titanic sister, which began to sail two years later, the Britannica, which was the sister of Titanica, of Titanic. And they were on that ship, and that sank. And then one of that person still went on the third ship, and that ship sank, and that's where they finally died. But it, anything that man makes is prone to fail. They built Titanic. They said, God cannot sink this ship. When it sank, they, 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 they gave Britannica a double hull, added some more gates. It was even more sure that it could not sink, and it sank. Man cannot come with anything that will outlast eternity. But the word of God is sure. It's true. And it all lasts eternity. Verse 9, he has sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. The short psalm, 10 verses. The, the name Lord is mentioned five times, and 19 times he mentions the phrase he or his. 19 times. Just, it's just, just 10 verses. What we see is that life does not revolve around us, really. It revolves around God and what he does. It revolves around his word and around his faithfulness. And I think the sooner we recognize that, the better. Life is not about us. It's really about God. It's about what he wants. It's about the purpose that he has given you to fulfill for his sake, for his purpose. So let us put our whole hope and trust in our Lord Jesus Christ and his promises. For they are sure and they stand fast forever. And never. If you find yourself in a difficult situation, maybe a chain or a gate of iron that is keeping you from the blessing of God, then pray to God. Cry out to him as the psalmist did. 
for deliverance. And he comes through every time. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you, Lord, that in a world that is uncertain, there is one thing that is certain, and that is the word of God. Is an anchor that stands fast. And we pray, Lord, for anyone that's here this morning that might find himself in a situation where he needs deliverance or she needs deliverance. I pray this morning is the time to come and to cry out to God. And sometimes we don't have deliverance because we don't seek it or we don't, we don't cry out to the Lord enough. We need to come and we need to pray and we need to seek and we need to ask. And when we do, God delivers every time.